This is Sea Wing in Parkhurst Prison. Locked up in here are some of the most dangerous men in Britain. Many are murderers. All are serving life sentences. My father would have drank for all my very young age. Could crime be inherited? Could there be a gene for crime? I'm a great believer in asking the experts, and here I'm surrounded by experts. If you ask, compare me to my old man. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I'm my old man over again, you know? Is that because the way he brought you up, or the way you were born because of him, is it? Yeah, yeah I'd say the way I was born. Yeah, yeah I'd say the way I was born, yeah. My mother's done time. My dad's done time. I'm doing a life sentence. Uh, on my mother's side of the family, all my uncles have done time. And on my dad's side of the family, a few of his brothers have done time, you know. So I would have to say, yeah, an inherited, yeah. I was originally sentenced to three and a half years for a robbery. Um, I'd done two months of that sentence and then uh, murdered a civilian instructor um, through personal, personal things that he said at the time I felt I couldn't let pass um, so I killed him You reckon you were born that way? Did you inherit this tendency um, to violence? My father has always been a violent person um, always, you know um, he's been in prison in the past for violence um, and he's known as a bit of a tear away and a bit of a thug, you know, and I've always been the same, you know. Um, no, I just knew that I would... There was something, I don't know, in, in my, my personality, my makeup that would kill, you know. You know, I knew that, you know... A part of me said, you know, I think wanted to... wanted to know how it felt. You know, to have the power over another human being. I, you know, if I'm honest, I think that's part of it. And as I got older, you know, that I was stuck in there somewhere, you know, and I kept coming back every now and again, you know. Mm. You know, you kind of do it, do it, you know. I thought for a long time that I was born evil. I was just an evil person. I was just, I'm not mad or anything. I've never been sexually abused as a child. I'm just evil for some reason. I just get a sadistic pleasure out of causing people pain and violence. And that's it. Born evil, it's a chilling phrase. It reminds me of the old idea of original sin. Perhaps some people are born imperfect and are bound to offend. Some geneticists are beginning to agree. I mean, most people accept genes affecting heart, genes affecting muscle, dwarfism, but some people, when it comes to genes affecting the brain, say, oh no, can't happen anymore. No mutants in the brain, can't, can't affect the function of the brain. It's, it's silly, I mean, it's, it's crazy. There are more genes active in the brain than in any other organ by a factor of 50%. 50% of all the genes we have are active only in the brain. And they are just as susceptible to mutation as all the other genes that we talk about. And, you know, from our studies, it's clear that uh, genes affect, can affect behavior, mutant genes. This is my personal Parkhurst, where I'm probably serving a life sentence. University College London. One of the founders of the college was fascinated by the roots of good and evil. Meet my boss. This is the body of the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. After he died, he had himself stuffed because he thought it would be cheaper than commissioning a monument. There's an odd connection between Bentham and Parkhurst Prison because Jeremy Bentham invented the modern prison system. 
Before him, prisons were just places to lock people up, but he thought that a prison should be a machine to grind rogues honest. And part of that machine was an observation tower in which the prisoners were watched by a series of hidden guards. They felt, no doubt, that they were constantly under the eye of an all-seeing, all-knowing God, and they simply didn't dare to misbehave. Bentham's prisoners had free will. They could become honest men if they were treated properly. There's another view that's represented by this extraordinary book. It's called The Atlas of the Criminal Man, and it's by an Italian, Cesare Lombroso. And Lombroso had a brilliant idea, which is really a hundred years before its time. He thought that perhaps he could identify criminals from their biology, in his case, from the way he, they looked. And he went out and he photographed hundreds of them to try and see if he could work out a criminal face. And here are the faces of a brigand, a thief, a murderer, and so on. Lombroso knew nothing about genes. But by looking for what he called the criminal type in the face and in the shape of the skull, he thought he could identify those born to offend. Lombroso was impressed by how many criminals had tattoos and seemed to share many other physical marks of crime. These criminal types might seem old-fashioned, but the idea that a tendency to crime is set at birth is being reborn using modern genetics. For many, that strikes right at the heart of the law, which is, after all, founded on free will. John McVicker used to be one of Britain's most notorious criminals. For McVicker, a career in crime was a matter of choice, not biology. In my, in, in my personal sort of account, uh, it would be a moral one, uh, and it would be that I chose crime, uh, chose crime in the circumstances that I grew up and, and found myself in as an adolescent. And indeed, I'd go further and say that the circumstances I found myself in my late 20s uh, in prison with a 26-year sentence were highly conducive to another choice, which was that I wasn't going to commit any more crime. And that's how I see it. I grew up in a working-class area near the docks in the east end of London where there was a sort of knocking-off culture. By the time I hit about 16, I gravitated to the sort of classic sort of bridge into crime, which was the billiard hall and dance halls and the drug scene, that kind of area. And within about a year, I was completely immersed in a subculture, which I took on with a vengeance and uh, identified with it. And I was in crime really for about, uh, well, at least uh, certainly my late teens and virtually all of my 20s. But even John McVicker had to think twice about free will when his own son began to follow the same career. Now, you could say that suddenly there was some mutation uh, gene introduced into my son, because my son turned to crime. Now, and I remember having quite long talks with his mother, uh, really mainly for, for a couple of visits, but mainly through letter, and saying to her that there, there was a lot of precipitating factors in his background that were likely to lead to delinquency. One of which, of course, was he had an absent father who was also a criminal. But he was also growing up in the same area as I did. He was a sporty, outgoing kid, and he had a, a parent who, who, who was unskilled and living off social security. So, it, you know, the warning signs were there. And she, some money was made available to her. And I, what I wanted her to do was to move into a, a, a nearby middle-class area. And that was the, the plan. Uh, and it failed because she spent the money on herself. But, you know, I was very aware of, 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 the, of the factors, the causal factors. Let's say for the sake of argument that they did find a gene for crime. Do you think that could ever be used as an excuse? No. Um, unless it, it's so determined behaviour that it overrode free will. And that's the test that will be and is being applied in court. Uh, so... Uh, so I think it's a false hunt, anyway. <laughs> but it's not a false hunt. 
Nothing in science ever is. The world's biggest investigation into the inheritance of crime began here, in one of the poorest and most deprived parts of London, Camberwell. And what they did was in 1961, was to choose about 400 eight-year-old children and to follow them for 30 and more years. To ask how many of them got into trouble with the law and what could you predict from what you found when they were eight as to what they do when they grew up. You really could make a very good job of predicting who was going to get into trouble with the law. The eight-year-old kids who ended up in prison nearly all had um, very poor homes. They tended to drink a lot when they were teenagers. They were badly behaved and caused trouble at school. But overwhelmingly, many, many of them had fathers who'd been in prison. So there's really no controversy about the fact that crime runs in families, it certainly does, and this very good piece of scientific research proves that. Genetics is all about inheritance, but inheritance certainly isn't all about genetics. Crime may run in families, but then so does being a member of the House of Lords. Those families shared their environment, Camberwell, as well as their genes. And of course, not all the children thought to be at risk ended up breaking the law. But now a geneticist has made a startling discovery. Han Brunner is a Dutch scientist. Recently, he was approached by a woman whose family had a record stretching back many years of aggression arson and rape. What Brunner discovered about her relatives was to cause an uproar. We told them that this was not a condition that we knew of. It wasn't in the books, so we couldn't find it. So we had no way of, of telling who were carriers and who were not carriers. Uh, so we had to, to do a genetic study to find out, and we warned them that it was going to take a long time. They brought with them a written account of their family's problem compiled by a, a great grand uncle. We know that he had a very severely affected brother. So he's, he's at the extreme end of the behavioral spectrum within this family. But what happened was that this brother um, raped his sister at age 23, was convicted for that, and then spent um, essentially the rest of his life in um, an institution for psychopaths. And one day, while he was working in the fields, he was urged by the overseer to, to work harder, and then he turned and stabbed him with a pitchfork. So that's a, a very uh, aggressive, impulsive act. Brunner immediately noticed a classic pattern of inheritance. The trait was shown by males, but passed on through their mothers. To a geneticist, that meant that if a gene was involved, it had to be on one particular chromosome, the X. We used various markers along the X chromosome to see if there was a specific location on the chromosome that was causing this. And we found a particular loca localization on the X chromosome. And interestingly enough, the location on the X chrom chromosome coincided exactly with a, no a known gene. That's called monoamine oxidase A. That gene, MAOA as it's called, is linked with the transmission of nerve impulses in the brain. If there was something wrong with it, that might explain the bizarre behavior. And here's the image which tells much of the whole story. What Han Brunner has done is to take 22 family members. And then with some very nifty biochemistry, he's taken out the piece of DNA that actually codes for this crucial brain enzyme that controls the chemical messages between nerves. And he's read the order of the letters, the DNA letters, in that particular piece of our own instruction manual. And that is actually read from top to bottom, like Japanese. And there are only four different letters in this DNA alphabet. And on this image, they're in different colors. It's very simple. They're blue, they're green, they're yellow, and they're red. And what we can do is zoom in. Well, on the first sight, they're identical to each other. But there's one crucial difference. 
One of them is distinct from the others. Most of them have got red and red, but this young man here has a genetic accident, a mutation, and he was one of those men who suffered from uncontrollable attacks of rage. I have to say that the genetic case seems watertight. The pedigree fits and the biochemistry fits. There's just one change in the DNA letters. One letter has changed out of 3,000 million. That's changed an enzyme, which has changed the chemistry of the brain, which has messed up the way the nerves communicate with each other, and finally has pushed this man further towards the threshold of rage. The press leapt on the discovery. It seemed that the problem of crime had been solved. Violence was all in the genes. That was a simplistic response to a complicated question, but suddenly a modern version of original sin was in the headlines. In the United States, violence is the leading cause of death among young people. Scientists at the National Institutes of Health have even classified it as a disease. Now Americans have seized on the idea of a gene for crime. I think, frankly, humanity is afraid to let go of the notion of free will um, and accept, on a scientific level, some degree of predestination. And that is something that is truly disturbing to a great many people who are unwilling or unable to believe that things they do and things they are are determined before they are actually born and in fact go back from the moment of conception. When you find the genetic marker for breast cancer, everybody thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. When you find the genetic marker for violence, people are scared to death. Lawyers Dan Summer and Chuck Taylor took a sudden interest in genetics because of a crime that was committed on the outskirts of Atlanta, the murder capital of the USA. This is the Domino Pizza store in Oakwood in Hall County in Georgia. It's a slightly sordid and anonymous kind of place. And in February 1991, it was the scene of extremely sordid crime because a young man called Stephen Mobley, who was then 25, decided to rob this place, as he had many others, and he came in armed with a gun and ordered the manager, John Collins, to empty the till and his pockets. And John Collins did that, and then, when his back was turned, Stephen Mobley simply shot him in the back of the neck, killed him, and left. Stephen Mobley, Tony as he's called, was quickly caught. He was found guilty on all counts. In America today, that almost inevitably meant he faced the death penalty. In this case, there was no dispute at the first phase. He had committed the crime, he had confessed to committing the crime. The real issue in this case had to do with sentencing. We found an article in the New York Times about the Bruner study, uh, read it, um, thought, well, maybe this is something we can pursue since there had been some history in terms of our client's life. When you actually meet Tony, he is a very witty, pleasant young man. He um, is intelligent. Uh, he's a very um, creative writer. I've had him write me short stories to pass the time in jail and to give him some uh, change. And you would never know that he has committed this heinous offense because he is such a witty, um, warm individual. And it's quite shocking that when people speak with him, the furthest thing in their mind is the fact that this individual committed a homicide in cold blood. But that gets back to um, why we feel there is a genetic component, because under certain environmental stressors, this impulsiv impulsivity is activated in some way, and as a result, you know, he carries out these, these deeds. Tony never knows when he walks in a room what he's going to do. Tony Mobley is locked up in here the eloquently named Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Center. He's got a lot to worry about because they do more than diagnose and classify people, they kill them because this is the site of Georgia's death row.
He's using science to appeal against execution. If he doesn't get away with that, he'll be killed by science or what passes for science. It's not widely known that this rather um, terrifying piece of apparatus was actually initially promoted almost as an advertising gimmick by Thomas Edison, who wanted to prove that alternating electric current, AC, was more dangerous than direct current, DC. Well, he certainly proved it with this. It kills people. To save Tony Mobley from the electric chair, the lawyers put his family at the center of their defense. We spoke with our client's father, who referred us to an aunt who was very familiar with the family history. And it became quite obvious to us that there was a very strong likelihood of a heritability factor for disturbed regulation of impulse control. And essentially, she related to us a number of family members spanning several generations who had demonstrated problems controlling impulses, which in some cases resulted in criminal type behavior. Well, Mobley's attorneys brought some family members into court to testified his father and his first cousin, Joyce Ann. And they testified to four generations of a great deal of violence, aggression, in some cases retardation, or simply acting out throughout the family tree. And you have family members, some of whom are extremely physically abusive, not only to their own family members, but to others. Uh, some who've, who have raped, some who have killed, some who have just been extremely aggressive. Isn't there a danger in using genetics? Couldn't it be used against somebody? Well, when we were arguing to the judge to admit this evidence, that was the comment he made. He said, I see this as being aggravating, not as being mitigating. Um, and that is being evidence that the state would want to present that, that exactly that, that this is a bad seed. That's the risk. On the one hand, uh, attorneys such as the Mobley attorneys could claim, and they're making the claim that it should be used as a mitigating factor. On the other hand, it's a double-edged sword because a jury could look at that evidence and claim this person is wired genetically. They're wired to kill. They're, they're born to kill, essentially. And they're very dangerous people. The most extreme version of that is we think that they should be executed. There's been a real push in this country been a lot of violence and it seems that it's getting worse every day and there's been a response uh, to want to lock up more and more and use the death penalty more and more and this is in a way a slam dunk for them. The sentence was death by electrocution. The case went to appeal. Now the lawyer's argument was that Mobley should be tested for the gene Han Brunner had discovered. But this time there was an unexpected setback. Isn't it a problem for your client's family if you suggest in court that they, as well as he, have what you might call a gene for crime? If the decision is between sullying the family name and keeping your client out of the electric chair, I think any competent attorney would trash the family to save the client. That's our job. And while certainly one would not, one would not intend to intentionally sully the family name, if that was the only thing that kept your client out of the electric chair, of course you would do that. And unfortunately, I believe that's the situation that we um, have found ourselves in in this particular case. Tell us about what your present position in this case now is. Well, our client's father has retained an attorney to convince our client that we do um, not represent his best interests and therefore we have been discharged from the case, I understand. And therefore, uh, his case is in the hands of new counsel. Um, we feel, of course, that this is a direct result of our attempt to use uh, the genetic evidence in mitigation because it's had the unintended consequence of selling the family name. Mobley's father saw to it that Summer and Taylor were dismissed from the case, and his son is still on death row. His genes were never tested in court. But a genetic defense had a different result in another case. B7, B, the number seven. Six. It's bingo night in Huntington Beach, California. Hi. Hi, Susa. Hi, Barbara. Good crowd today? Yeah, yeah. Master of Ceremonies is John Baker. Okie doke. Nice to see you. Good to see you. I 24. I 24. Yeah, honey, I'm not working tonight. 
He's making a fortune out of the American gambling habit. Lucky ladies. Oh, yes, we do. I already won $100 on hotel. Oh, great, great. Are you having a good time? Wonderful. Well, I'm good. And how about Fern and John? How are they doing tonight? Oh, fine. Oh, good. good. But John Baker has a secret past. Once he was a lawyer with an addiction of his own. I think what happened is that I worked uh, awfully hard, the stress, I drank a lot, I used drugs a lot, and uh, when you're doing that, then you don't use good judgment. I took money from a client's trust fund account, which is absolutely prohibited. When I took the money, it was because I was in rehab at the time for my alcoholism. I had no money to run my law office. I had a secretary, I had overhead, I had bills to pay. I told her to take the money out of the trust fund account to pay bills, which she did. I didn't use the money for drinks for this. I used it to pay bills so I could keep my law office going. I thought while I was in rehab, if I didn't pay, things would start going under. I would lose everything I had. This was the only way to keep everything I had. Um, it was a bad decision. It was the wrong decision. But at the time, in an alcoholic kind of stupor, it was the only decision that I could, uh, that I could use. I went to my attorney and he said, tell me about your background. Where did you grow up? Where did your mother grow up? And I said, my mother's an Indian. I'm an Indian. I've had uh, Indian blood. And he said, well, I think they're, they have an alcoholic gene or something like that that predisposes them to be an alcoholic. And I said, I don't know anything about that offhand. Um, and he said, well, I think that there's a defense there that you were born to be an alcoholic and whether you grew up in an alcoholic home or not, and that probably just aggravated everything, and especially going to Vietnam, I think there's a reason that you did what you did. And I said, well, I don't think so, because even if I was an alcoholic and an Indian, that doesn't mean that you take money that doesn't belong to you, when you know it doesn't belong to you. And he said, well, that doesn't matter. We're talking a strict legal defense. And I said, well, whatever will help me, because I didn't want to be disbarred. And for the first time in legal history, a defense based on genes worked. Baker was not disbarred, but he didn't go back to his old job. Let me show you some of my legal artifacts I still have. I have my uh, Supreme Court telling me I can practice law in the state of California. And my diploma and some more of my legal books that I use occasionally, once in a while, when I have a friend that needs to uh, ask me a legal question. But I'll look it up and let them read it for themselves and make their own decision. Is this kind of a shrine to your legal past or just an office? Gee, I never thought of it as a shrine. That's, a, that's exactly what it is, a shrine to my legal past. Maybe, it's, I, a, maybe it's a mausoleum of your legal past. Right? That's what it is. It's, it's me. It's the old me. No, I like it. People, it's impressive. People come in and I look at it and say, Gee, I could be studying all those every day of my life still. You don't miss it? Not at all. Not a bit. Baker's problem was the one faced by the Mobley family. His genes had become a label that he couldn't hide. I have taken myself out of the practice of law because of what I did. Um, I'm not proud of it. I don't think I should practice law. It's a double-edged sword. When I didn't get disbarred, um, I was probably as happy as I've been in my life and at the same time as sad because I knew that one day uh, people would be citing my name in cases for their clients and I would still be, my name would be out there and people would hear my story. Um, it's not something I'm proud of, to tell you the truth. I live in infamy. Well, there's a big difference between being on death row and being forced to run a bingo supply business. But both for Stephen Mobley and John Baker, genetics caused problems rather than providing a simple solution. But genetics is going to really raise a much more severe problem, which not many people have noticed. And that is, it's showing that we're all biologically different. We've all got our own unique genes. In that Dutch family, there was a particular enzyme, MAO, which simply didn't work. I happen to know that I've inherited a gene for a form of that enzyme that scarcely works at all. If I eat too much cheese or drink red wine, I turn into a ravening monster. And that's the real difficulty. Because we're all different, because we're all unique, if we use that information in society and in the law, as we already do in medicine, 
then we're all in danger of being drawn into the genetic net. David Cummings was once president of the American Society for Human Genetics. Now he's an enthusiast for the idea that some people are born to break the law. The ticks are still present, but they're livable, not as... Mm -hmm. Dr. Cummings runs a clinic for behavioral disorders at the City of Hope Medical Center in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Was he doing any what we call oppositional behavior? What was he doing? Um, everything you didn't want him to do. Of course. <laughs> you know, if you asked him to... to Thousands to of children have been treated here, and demand is rocketing. First she called me because he was having problems on the bus. Mm -hmm. He was got referrals on the bus, just he got expelled from PE just because he wasn't following the directions and, and all that. And so I, t oh, and he was, he was disturbing. Um, he was disturbing. Cummings is convinced yeah, that the problems he sees are inborn and that today's naughty child may become tomorrow's criminal. Did you hit someone in PE? But everybody agrees that these motor and vocal tics are genetic. Uh, exactly how they're inherited is some dispute, but everybody agrees it's genetic. And we and others have now studied the frequency of these other associated behaviors, both attention deficit disorder and conduct disorder, and they are also associated with this uh, condition, both in the patients and in the, in the relatives and the families. So to me, this is very strong evidence that genes are playing a role in oppositional behavior and conduct disorder. And this forms a pool of children who, when they grow up, may have more difficulties. If Dr. Cummings is right, this place is a hotbed of genetic disease. It's the attractively named Sierra Conservation Center. That's Californian for prison. It's doing a roaring trade, annual growth rate 10%. One of the inmates knows Dr. Cummings very well. His name is Brian Bakhtiari. So, Brian, okay, let's just talk. Um, so, tell us, how long have you been here? I've been here four months. And what's your uh, length of sentence? Um, ten years, four months. So, you've got around ten years to go. What got you into this place? I mean, what are you, what got me into what, this place? Yeah. Um, for robbery, 211. Armed robbery. Armed robbery? Yes. Oh. Well, I was looking through his old chart, and I first saw him as a child. And his mother said he had an impulsive, aggressive behavior, what we call oppositional, defiant uh, behavior. He had short attention span. He couldn't sit still in class. The teachers were complaining about his behavior in class. He tended to be aggressive toward other children, hitting them, sometimes uh, hitting them with the knives or with the scissors. He uh, killed his pet, whether it's accidental or not. I think it was probably not so accidental. He was being aggressive toward his mother. And for a young child, this is very distinctive behavior, way out of what you expect of a normal child. Were you surprised that Brian ended up in prison? I'm not surprised. Brian's story began in the Los Angeles suburb of Whittier. His mother, Abigail, has kept her own records of her son's life. This is Brian's baby book, and here's his, the family tree, his father's side, my side. Here's his father, here I am, and then there's Brian right there. The baptism. Here he was two months old. And then these are pictures of his preschool, when he started going to preschool. Uh, this is Halloween, and I made him the outfit. You know, I don't know, he was always into trouble. He's always been a problem. So um, I didn't think anything of it at the time. I just thought that was him. And as he got older, I began to notice that he was hyper. He was always being rejected by the fact that he was impulsive in order to attract attention with his other friends, he'd push him or 
pull him. And of course, the other kids weren't, weren't used to that, so they would push him aside. And, uh, and it got to a point where Brian didn't have any playmates. And then, then he would begin to feel bad because he wondered why they didn't like him. And he tried hard to, to play with the kids, but he, he overpowered them. I feel um, growing up, um, a lot of people said I was real restless, hyper, through um, the tics, I guess, that I had and not being able to um, be and stay, stay still for more than five minutes. I would have to be jumping around, making rackets. Never really um, focused in on, um, on like trying to meet other people. It's because I would always like try to um, just trying to fit in or something. So I guess um, I had the problem of um, always um, fighting and just trying to. So I knew that there was something wrong and I kept searching with the different doctors, uh, trying to find some help. I didn't know exactly what was wrong with him, but I knew that there was something different. Go oh, oh, backwards. Oh, backwards. Brian's behavior got worse. Then Abigail saw a TV documentary about Dr. Cummings and took her son to the City of Hope Clinic. According to Cummings, the diagnosis was simple. Brian's behavior was caused by genes that took him out of the ordinary and into trouble. Uh, some people might say, how is he different from any other uh, you know, rank busters child? But the difference is the persistence of the, of the problem and the intensity of that oppositional aggressive behavior. Uh, every child has the right to have some of this behavior. But when it's persistent every day and goes on for years and years and years, we consider that to be abnormal. The parents often come in and they say to me, there's something wrong with my child. I go to these therapists, they tell me it's all my fault. I don't discipline him enough, I discipline him too much. Our husband and we're divorced, it's due to that, he was abused, something like that. And I inher they inherently know that's not correct. And then when they find out that this is a genetic disorder and responds very well to treatment, they're very pleased about it. Now, what grade are you in? Uh -huh. What grade? No, the camera. Third grade. Third grade. What school? Galton. For a long time. I thought maybe I had taken something uh, during my pregnancy that had affected him. I didn't know who to blame, but I thought that it was me, the one that had, had born him different. At least I knew what was wrong with him. Hey. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Dr. Cummings provides more than a diagnosis. He offers redemption as well. Just want me to tell you what medication you're taking now. Um, Cataprest, I think. This is a patch? Yeah, the patch. And what size patch are you taking? Uh, I think it's a one. One. And what did you notice? Or maybe I should ask you, what did you notice when he's on the medication? When he's on the medication? I notice it more when he's off the medication. Right. Yes. When he stopped taking ORAP, he went... He started shaking very much. Mm -hmm. Worse than he is now. Worse. Um, right. He started, the concentration was a lot better mm -hmm. in school. Um, the head ticks mm -hmm. decreased tremendously. Okay. Still doing a little bit. Uh, still a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nearly every child who comes here is given drugs that suppress their disruptive behavior. Any side effects from it? No. Yes, you do. From what? <laughs> he's, he's very sleepy. Brian's life was transformed by Cummings' treatment. For a time, with the help of the drugs, he turned into an all-American boy. Brian attended school here for two years. In fact, his best behavior was here in this school. But it didn't last. Brian began to hate the side effects. He felt sleepy and sick. He was embarrassed about being labeled as different at school because he had to wear a skin patch full of drugs. I felt like um, I didn't need to take it anymore. I felt like I could, I could overcome it on my own. Didn't need the medication. Just, just kind of tired, lazy of t yeah. about taking the medicine. And I think that part of it was that the patch, his friends would have seen it and uh, he stopped taking it. And I, I wasn't aware of it until about five, six months later. And then when I confronted him, he just said that he wanted to try being without the medication. And, and he says, Mom, I'm doing fine. My ticks are not coming out. You know, let, let, give me a chance and let me try it out. Eventually it turned out that 
He didn't want the patch. He, he was getting side effects, but he wasn't telling me. You can't help someone that doesn't think they have a problem and doesn't want to take medication. We have to respect that. Now, in Brian's case, he got to be an adult. We kept him doing pretty good at his adolescence, and he went off the medication, and within about a year, he was in serious trouble. And we started having more and more problems and friction, so I kept looking for signs that would tell me that he was drinking or using drugs or what was going on, but then I noticed the kind of friends that were calling were, to me, the wrong kind of people. Are you going to chill out? Yeah, you're going off. I just saw you go off. What's your problem? Well, then it turned out that he had to go to court on Monday. Me thinking that it was a one-time thing, I went over there and I thought they will let him out on probation and then everything will be solved. Well, when I got there, it turned out that somehow the kids had um, confessed to seven robberies, which I was just shocked. I do um, regret doing it, but um, how I was feeling, I just um, wished I had, I wasn't working at the time, so I just wished I had money at the time. And um, that's how I came around to, to doing it, Friday night, wanting money, and um, to go out, party, you know. At least 50% of people in prison population have uh, symptoms of attention deficit disorder. Uh, some think it's even higher than that. To use a term like a gene for crime is pretty simplistic, but what do you think of the idea that most prisoners are there because of the way they were born? Well, I think they have a lifelong pattern similar to Brian. They frequently start out early in life. They have symptoms of hyperactivity and aggressive behavior. The best predictor of aggressive behavior when you're an adult is the presence of aggressive behavior when you're a child. There's no question that Dr. Cummings is a major figure in the genetical world and has done some very valuable work. However, I have to say that in his later life, he's committed that terrible California sin, the worst of all scientific sins, which is the sin of optimism. That is, he's hopeful about his results, and I get the feeling he's trying to prove his hypothesis that genes cause crime, to put it simply, um, rather than disprove it. And that simply ain't the way you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to look for exceptions. You're not supposed to look for support. And when I look at some of his pedigrees, and I see discussed on the same page somebody who's a topless dancer and somebody who's a very successful executive as having the same genetic condition, which is impulsiveness, shall we say, I begin to ask myself, who doesn't fit his theory? I mean, do I fit his theory? Have I got the gene? I mean, I'm making this television program. Maybe I'm some kind of compulsive, obsessive neurotic. Um, so I think he really is not perhaps being quite as gloomy as he ought to be. But of course, this is Southern California, and you're not supposed to be gloomy here. Brian's lawyers are about to use his genes to appeal against his sentence. Hi, babe. I'm sitting out here. It's Sunday, and it's a beautiful day. It was a nice surprise to get your call this morning. I think everything's going to come out fine. Thank God. He's opening doors for us. I'll try to get a court order to send you your tennis shoes and I'll let you know what happens. Take care, Corazón de Milón. That's my pet name. I will talk next week, and I'll share things with you. Talk to you later, and God bless you. Remember, have faith and hope. Love, Mama. The idea of a destiny set before birth is much older than genetics. It's fundamental to Christianity. It's the doctrine of original sin. Albi Cathedral, on the edge of the Pyrenees, is a monument to the problem of good and evil and how they should be judged. Uh, 
Like all medieval cathedrals, this building is a book. A book designed to be read by the illiterate. It contains within itself the whole story of the Bible, from the creation to the last judgment. And it's the last judgment that makes Albi Cathedral famous. It's the biggest painting in France. Nobody knows who painted it, but whoever he was, he put his whole heart and his whole soul into his work. It contains a simple and terrifying message about the last days. The dead are rising from the grave to be saved and go to heaven, or to have their sins found out and burn in various complicated forms of hell that lie below. The most extraordinary thing about this whole extraordinary painting is what's missing from it. We have the dead, the saved, and the damned. But who's deciding about them? There's nobody there. In the 18th century, an arch was driven through the middle of the painting, and someone crucial was destroyed. There was an avenging angel with scales in which the sinners and the saved were measured. He's gone. This is a judgment without a judge. Some geneticists would like to put themselves in that vacant arch to judge who is saved and who is damned. The logic of genetics is that the book of life can be read not after death, but before we're born. But to do that for crime is to deny free will to everyone, good or evil. Society, the law itself, is not the product of genes, but of people. And what people do must be judged by society and not by science.